Uh, bueno, mi nombre es Rodrigo Domínguez. Eh, como sabéis, trabajar mucho en la open source, más que trabajo eh, para empresas y muchas de las cosas que hago es el espacio confidencial. Pero en fin, uh, una de las cosas lindas de la conferencia que se armó hoy, más allá de que es la primera y que es un poco chica, es que tenemos speakers de muchísima calidad y muchos de ellos uh, no necesitan realmente introducción. Bueno, siendo la Keynote. Este, Simon Thompson, es una persona que trabaja con la programación funcional de los años 80, que no es poca cosa, escribió varios libros, eh, Hacker, un tipo de pendientes y demás, es un profesor muy reconocido de la Universidad de Kent, donde enseña R a sus alumnos y lo lleva hacia la práctica profesional. Hoy en día uno de sus enfoques es eh, la transformación de código, eh, en, en, en ayudar a, a la investigación y el desarrollo de herramientas para la transformación de código, Uh, ya fuese uh, refactories, migraciones, eh, operation APIs y demás. Y bueno, como bueno, todo el brujo, está trabajando este, en Future Lab, eh, haciendo cursos eh, masivos online. Este, eh, bueno, sería bueno que en su momento lo vean. Eh, bueno, lo dejo a Simon. Ok. Mucho obrigado de, de uh, fazer o... o, o uh, I, I rehearsed it. No. no. <laughs> Desculpe, eu, eu não vou falar em português, em <laughs> castelhano. Eu vou falar inglês, uh, infelizmente. Ok. So, Erlang is a... And the reason Erlang is so, is so popular and is so um, heavily used is that it's a concurrent, fault-tolerant, robust, dis distributed programming language. And one of the things we're going to talk about, and particularly Ben's talk at the end of the day, is going to tell us some of the benefits of, of those features of Erlang. What Erlang is as well is a, a functional programming language. And what I'd like to do today is talk a bit about some of the features of functional programming that are perhaps a bit beyond what we do when we first learn functional programming, but are useful tools in our toolkit. And so I want to talk, that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to talk through a number of ideas, a number of examples. Um, the code, I'll put the code I'm going to show is up on GitHub. I'll put the link for that later on. So it's showing you some ideas of what people do with functional programming once they move beyond the first stage. Okay, so when we first learn Erlang, we discover key things we learn. We start to write functions using pattern matching, and that's such a, that's such a benefit when we see it. We don't have to write accessors, we don't have to write discriminators. We can just say, in this case, do this, in this case, do this, and in this case, when I've got these components, do um, do that. So we use pattern matching and recursion is the, the, the engine of repeated computation. And it's interesting, um, we're running our, our online course at the moment and for people coming into our language from other, other languages, particularly from an imperative background, recursion is still seen as, as a hurdle. But once you get it, you get it big time, I think. Um, here you can see, I'm not using tail recursion, but that's the, as it were, the gateway drug into, um, into what goes on in doing things in Erlang. Um, this is some code for maze solving, which you can find in the, in the repo. But what Erlang also has, and the thing we, we learn as well, is that we are able to model inside Erlang all sorts of different data types. Now, I think there's a, there's a misconception that Erlang Erlang types are not as strong. Well, in some sense, in a technical sense, they aren't as strong. But there's a misconception that Erlang's types are not as expressive, or Erlang data is not as expressive as in other languages. But of course, that's not the case. It's just that we build things explicitly. So if we want to build a type that represents shapes, we represent them explicitly as a tuple tagged with a a, um, an atom. 
but we're able to express, express the things that people can express in other languages like Haskell. And one of the things I'll come back to at the end of the talk is to try to make a comparison between what we do in Erlang and what we do in Haskell. But of course, the other thing is our variables are immutable. We write an assignment there. It's not an assignment. It's simply a naming of a value. And that's crucial. And you know, 20 years after Java was launched, people in the Java community are beginning to understand why immutability is such a crucial thing because they can then write much safer multi-threaded code. Ha! 20 years. But and I guess another theme of this is how long it takes for new ideas to come through in programming. We think computer science moves, computing moves at a very fast pace. In fact, some things move really, really rather slowly, and I'll, I'll come back to that. And the other things we meet. We meet tail recursion, as I said. That's the engine of writing iterative programs. Um, and we meet some standard higher order functions. You know, we write things using filter and concat, and then we've got a nice syntax for it using list comprehensions. And we can write, we can write our own functions, um, which I'm doing there. So that, in a sense, I could stop there. And, and that, is, that would be enough of a functional language to write a lot of the things that we do. But for the rest of the talk, what I want to do is show how we go beyond that. And I think the crucial thing is um, if you look at the types that Erlang contains, it has standard things like numbers and atoms and so on, but functions are there as a type. So the thing that gives a huge amount of power to functional programming in general is um, it's the power of fun. Now this is a quote from Sorry, these are far too small to read. I'll put the slides on the GitHub as well. This is a quote from Joe Armstrong's History of Erlang. And it's interesting. He says in here, they tried out, they originally wrote Erlang in a, in a, as a, a prologue, on top of prologue. But they say, what started as the addition of concurrency to a logic language ended us with removing all the prologue features and adding many, many well-known features of functional languages. The influence is clear. So Erlang is, is functional. But I think the thing that I want to, I'll be concentrating on now for the rest of the lecture is this keyword, fun. It's a nice pun in English. We're going to have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're going to have fun with functions. And the key thing to learn, the key thing to appreciate, is that functions are not just in the language to pass into things like list map and, and so on, list filter, but they are pieces of data just like any other piece of data. Christopher Strachey, who was, was one of the pioneers of understanding semantics of computing languages, and, and, a, and a, a language designer as well, coined this phrase, functions are first-class citizens. You can do with functions what you can do with any other sort of data. But what's, what's special about a function um, is that this is active data, if you like. It expresses some sort of behavior. A function does something. You know, a list is a list. Um, a value is a value. Uh, you know, a number is a number, but a function will do things. It represents computation in some way. So they are special kinds of data because of that. Um, and I want to give an example. The, s the simplest example I can think of of using functions to represent, um, represent a, a piece of data is the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. Which I guess everyone understands. I can explain it if you like. <laughs> Two people play, and simultaneously you choose, one chooses one of these things, another chooses one, and you then decide what the result is. Rock wins against scissors because a rock will blunt a scissors. Scissors win against paper because they can cut paper. Paper wins against rock because it can wrap the, paper, the rock up. 
So it's a simple game, two-person game. What is a strategy for playing rock, paper, scissors? You can play randomly, you can echo the echo somebody's last play. You can I'll come back to, to what these things mean a bit later on. There are various things you can do. You can do some statistics on, on what your opponent has done. But what it is, if you look a bit deeper, it's we choose what to play depending on your last moves. Or in fact, we can depend on the whole of your moves. If we're doing something statistical, we think, oh, okay, you've done, you've, you've played rock more than you've played the other two. I'm going to guess you're going to play rock more in the future. Or perhaps less, if you're even out. So what we have here is a, a strategy, is this choice. We are choosing depending on the history of our opponent's moves. Now, what does that mean in practice? That means that we have a function from the list of plays that our opponent has played to what we play next. So a natural way of representing that strategy is as a function. Because we're listing our type of plays, it's just a list of single plays. So a strategy is naturally one of these things. And what's nice about that is that we are, we're able to represent very compactly what these different ideas mean. So a random strategy, or we just do something random. An echo, what I'm doing here is I'm building my list so that the last play of the, the, the previous player, uh, no, sorry, the previous play of the, other, of, the last, of the other player is on the top of the list. So I'm building the list like a stack. If I echo, um, and I have a list of with whose head is X, then I just play that back. So if you played rock last time, I play rock this time. Not sure it's a terribly good strategy, but people do do it. This is a nice one. This is a really good, if you want to, if you want to make money playing rock, paper, scissors, this is the place to do it. Um, though I guess not with somebody else who's in the room, I suppose. In general, People think that playing randomly means you never repeat your last move. If you, look, if you ask people to look at uh, pictures of random data, they will normally, if they're looking at random dots of, of uh, black and white pixels, they will choose something which is not quite random. It will be smoother than random. A purely random block of, of black and white pixels will have some quite big subblocks of, of white and a black. If you're choosing sequences of plays, you'll have quite a number of repeated plays where, you, where the, same, the player plays the same play more than once. But people's intuition is somebody won't play the same move twice. If that's the case, then you can play not to lose. Because what happens? If last time round the player played rock, you can assume this time they're going to play paper or scissors. So what do I play? I play scissors because that will beat paper and draw with scissors. So I can always avoid losing by betting that my opponent won't, um, won't repeat, and often they won't. The details aren't important, but you can, um, you can go further. Uh, there's a URL a bit later on that talks about this. Um, but the point is, now we have represented strategies, instead of, of uh, expressing them as, as uh, atoms or whatever, they're, they're active behaviours, we can now do, perform an interaction with a, um, with a strategy. So here's a little game that plays, you feed in the strategy as a parameter, and it, um, uh, what sex is here? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. You feed in, this is the, the, um, the tail recursion. Um, so you feed in a strategy and what it does, it, it will play, um, it will play against 
inputs that you, you in, input interactively. But it's nice that we've, adapt, we've pulled out that strategy and we can play, any, any game player can now just feed in whatever strategy they like. So functions can represent active behavior. And we can easily plug in any other strategy we wish just by writing another functional description of that strategy. But now we think of functions as, as uh, of strategies as functions, we can begin to do something else, and that's to start combining strategies together. And this is what people call a combinator. We're combining functions together to give us another function. And this is really where you're doing functional programming with functions as data. The functions are data, so you have functions that take some strategies as input, give you a strategy as output. Here are three things you might do. You could just, to build a new strategy, you could choose randomly between some strategies you've got already. You could apply them all. And in a particular case, and choose the result that comes up that is most popular from all your set of strategies. Um, or you could replay each of them on the history that you've got so far and choose the one that has best predictive power over the history. Um, so, once we start thinking of wrapping up behavior as a function, we then start thinking of writing functions that work over that. And I think that's one of the, um, that, that's one of the insights that I wanted to, um, you to go away with. And you can see here, this is this. This voting, it's, it's simply a function from a list of strategies to a strategy. So the take home from this bit of the talk is, okay, it's a toy example. But what we get by representing strategies as functions, rather than just an atom for random, an atom for um, no repeats or whatever, is that we have complete generality. We allow ourselves to have a potentially infinite collection of strategies. And we go up this one level. We, th we start thinking about how can we put these strategies together. Just as when we start writing lists, we begin to think, um, we start writing functions, just working over lists, but we see the abstraction and build higher order functions like map and filter and so on. We get these co combinators that combine strategies together. So a very natural, using functions as data is a really nice thing in our armory. But you could say, ha, huh, it's a toy example. All of these, in a way, are toy examples because they fit on a slide, they fit in a small file. They're something that you can understand. But the ideas do scale up. Um, and for example, here, oh, sorry, just before I move on, there is a wonderful website, which is the World Rock, Paper, Scissors Society. This is not a spoof website. This is a real website. It has all sorts. It's got stuff for... Game Basics has got an advanced section. If you're interested in this stuff, it is fascinating. Um, well, to an extent. Um, there's, there's clearly something going on in their website with a bit of sort of passive-aggressive stuff about their web, their webmaster not being very good. Um, it does look better, but obviously it took them a lot of, it was a lot of pain to get there. But it's a really, it's, it's a fascinating site. But the, the insight is, um, do please think about even, to, even a simple thing like a strategy as a function. And here is the, this is the GitHub repository that has the, um, the code I'm talking about. Uh, and I'll put, a, um, I'll put the slides up there when we're finished. Okay, so that was a toy example, small example. How does this grow up? Well, in a phrase, one key example that you will have seen, um, I, I would imagine you will have heard of, but maybe not, is the idea of parser combinators. Um, what we're doing here is, it's a similar insight. What does a parser do? If you think of it as a, an operation like this, it takes some text and it gives you a couple of outputs. It gives you a parse tree of the amount of text it's managed to, to parse. And, because we're being functional here, we're thinking of this we return the remaining text. So as a function, no side effects, we take some text and we get back a pair of a parse tree, what we've successfully parsed from the beginning of the text, plus the remainder of the text. 
So we can represent a parser as a, um, as a function. So here's some, here's some Erlang code. I'm using quite heavily using type, types and specs because it's really, it's a very nice way of documenting your code. Write the types and specs, feed those into Typer, um, and it will check whether you have. Typer just gives you a nicer interface to dialyzer than um, the dialyzer itself. So parsers are functions that take a string and return a pair of, of abstract syntax tree in a string. And then, for example, applying one parser, then another, becomes this function sequence takes two parsers and returns a parser. So this is the this is the first the canonical example people talk about in Haskell, but also in, in lots of other languages of writing using functions as um, using functions in anger to represent stuff. Now what we've done here is represent deterministic parsers. It might be that a parser is non-deterministic. It might be it can um, it can potentially read more from the beginning of a string. For example, suppose you're trying to, to um, parse a number. You might read the first digit, turn that into a number. You might read the first two digits, and so on. So you potentially have a number of parses, each of which has a corresponding remainder of the text. But we can model that just as easily as a function. We take a string, um, and we return a list of all the results. So the way that you represent functionally something that is, is non-deterministic is to say, I don't care which results I get, I'm just going to take them all. So um, we're taking string and we get back all the possible parses. So that will be an abstract syntax tree with one string, abstract syntax tree with another, and so on. And sequencing is still the same type signature. We still can sequence two parsers together, we have to feed the, non the output, all the out potential outputs from the first parser as inputs to the second, each of which will produce multiple outputs, and then squish them all together. Um, so this is a bigger and more substantial example that serves to show how functions get used in um, to represent complex data. Um, so it's a real example. There are implementations of parser combinators. I guess they started in Haskell. There's a number of libraries in Haskell which use them. They also in Scala, you see them. OCaml, Elixir, I can find at least four on the, um, on the web. There seem to be two on GitHub which have a single contributor, which is always slightly worrying. Um, but there are two which are, are sufficiently used that they, they feel they have to compare each other, um, compare themselves with the other library in order to explain why theirs is, is better. So this is something that is used, particularly in the Elixir community, for building parsers. It's a practical mechanism for doing that. It's a more constructive way of doing things than something like Yak, which does everything underneath the, under the hood. It produces a, a, a typically produces a, a, a um, an efficient parser, but it will, um, everything is hidden from you. Whereas in this, you explicitly construct through a set of function applications that mirror what's going on in your grammar, you explicitly construct the, the, the parser you need. And it hints at something more general, which I'll, I'll come back to later on. Okay, so where are we at? We've seen that just taking function seriously, taking fun seriously, gives us a new way of representing data. Now, this is, I guess this is something people in, in the OO world have done, though not, you know, anonymous objects, um, perhaps. It's... It's so much easier here. You get, you simply have a different kind of input. You process it and produce this different kind of output, but you're still writing functions to do that. Okay, now the, the, just going back to um, 
the example here. One of the things that, that makes this practical in a language like Haskell is that um, even though what this does is produce the list of all the answers, you don't have to look at them all. What do I mean by that? Um, well, put it another way. If all we're looking for is one part, we should perhaps think, about, think, think differently about how we do evaluation. We should perhaps think of evaluating that collection of all the passes on demand. So what I want to do in the, um, for the next bit of the talk is explore what that means and how we can, how we can, um, how we can program that, how we can model that in Erlang. So let's think about evaluation on demand. And you know, this is, I, I think when I say it in Erlang, I probably mean in Elixir as well, but I'm not an Elixir expert. So if I say something that is, is untrue about Elixir, please bear with me. Function uh, evaluation in Erlang works this way. If you have an application of a function to a set of arguments, you first evaluate the arguments, then you execute the body. So if you want to write a function like this, which takes a number and says, if that number is bigger than zero, return whatever the second argument is, otherwise, return the third argument. It's if-then-else, if you like, as a function, or it's a special case of if-then-else. It's not ideal writing that in Erlang, because what will happen, you will pass in something for the, the first argument, you evaluate that to a number, you pass in what to do if that number is zero, evaluate that, what to do if that number isn't zero, oh, evaluate that as well. So, we have that sort of restriction. We are um, evaluating arguments before we're evaluating the body. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this. It's simply a, an observation. It says that we can't, as it stands, write a function like that. We can do something with macros, um, and you know, I'll, I'll touch on macros later on for doing other things. We can write something like that using the Erlang macro system, but in general, um, macros are limited. I had this bizarre bug in something I, I, I'm going to talk about later on. I was banging my head against the wall. And I realized it was just the limit. I was hitting a macro bug. They're, they're most difficult to debug. So one should use them, one should use them sparingly. But anyway, we evaluate all the arguments before we evaluate the body. The other thing we do is that we fully evaluate the argument. Here's a function, don't ask me why, but what we're doing is taking a list. What I'm doing is adding the first two numbers in the list. We'll see some list examples a bit later on which are more, make more sense. But I have an argument which is a list. I pattern match A and B and the remainder. The way evaluation works is I fully evaluate that list before I return um, those two, the sum of the first two values. So not only do I evaluate arguments before the body, I fully evaluate. So there is no gray, there is no ambiguity, there's no gray area. I do all of the arguments completely. So the question is, can we do something differently? Can we make Erlang do something differently? Well, one argument is you, you could say, well, just throw Erlang away and use Haskell, but that has an awful lot of disadvantages. Um, so I think that wouldn't be a good idea. And I think there are people in the Haskell community, there's a, there's a debate in the Haskell community which isn't resolved about whether it's... Because what happens in Haskell, it's lazy, it supports these kinds of things by default, but then the compiler has to work very hard under the hood 
to work out where it can be strict, where it can do these things, because it's much more efficient in terms of time and potentially space, um, to do this, this sort of evaluation. So it has to do all sorts of, of, of analysis work inside the compiler, which is you know, not necessarily what we want. So, but let's see whether we can make Erlang a bit more lazy, a bit more... Um, and the key idea is this, and now, you, know, you may well have seen this before, but it's, it's nice to see it's another example of having fun. If an argument is a function, then it's passed unevaluated. So if we want to pass some stuff to a function, we can wrap it up like this. So you call it a, call it a thunk or a closure. So we've got this stuff, but we turn it into a function that takes no argument and returns stuff. And then if we want to use it, we just have to apply it to no argument. So this wraps it up, and this, if you like, this suspends computation and this forces computation. But it gives us a way inside our like, and we're using, we're focusing in here on, it's precisely because of the way functions are handled. So we're using that to give us um, a different way of handling evaluation. <clears throat> so, let's have a look. And let's do an example. Let's build streams in our lab. So what do I mean by a stream? Well, it's something where data is flowing in. We're perhaps getting data, it's coming in, it's coming down the wire. We're not quite sure um, when the next piece is coming in. But it's something that never gets, if you like, never gets fully evaluated. So we pull things off a stream, perhaps we also want to put things onto a stream. So in one way, it's a bit like a list. But in another, it's, we don't ever want to evaluate it completely. So here is, um, here is our code for building and unpacking a stream. Here's our construction. It takes a first element and the, the rest of the stream and it puts them inside a thunk. It, here's our stuff and we're turning that into a, that into a function. What we do if we want to take the head of a list, because that, that list is going to be a function, we apply it and then we when we apply it, we get back, we get inside there, we can take the head. When we apply it here, we can get inside the tail. What's wrong with this? Anyone like to tell me where there's a mistake in this? What is the fatal flaw in my definition? Maybe when you evaluate it, uh, you are evaluating the whole thing. When I, sorry? When you, you are evaluating... Like here? Yeah. No, when in, I, in head or in tail? In head or tail. Are you evaluating the whole thing? Well, this, this thing, remember, this thing itself might be another stream. So that's not a problem. You're not evaluating the whole thing. You're just unpacking that to whatever is in there. Yeah. But can you see, can you see what the, other, what the, the problem is? Well, let's assume, well, we could make an empty list, yeah. Let's, let's assume they never end. The parameters. The parameters. What happens when I call the cons and there's a stream there? I evaluate the arguments, which I don't want to do. <laughs> so what I have to do is make it a macro. So if I make it a macro, this just gets substituted. When I see a cons, I just wrap it up in a function. I don't evaluate that x's. So good old Erlang macros allow me to write something that looks like a cons, but in fact is just a, a it's not a function call, it's a macro call. And all this does is substitute whatever is in there inside your code. 
But if I did this and I called cons, it would evaluate that. So that would mean when I built a stream, I'd have to, I'd have, to have evaluated all of the stream already, which defeats the purpose of me building streams in the first place. So just one simple, um, one simple change allows me to, um, to build, I now build these things with this macro, it just gives me, it wraps up whatever x and x is, is whatever that stuff is, inside a function called, and it only gets unwrapped when I call head or tail. Isn't that nice? I think it's nice. Okay, let's, let's build some examples. Um, here's a stream. It's the, the stream of ones. So ones is just ones, one, stuck on the front of the same stream. Now you can imagine, if that was a cons, what would happen? I call this, it would want to evaluate that, oops, I go around forever. But that's not, and I'll show you, I'll show you in a second. Um, you can think of this, and I'll come back to this, you can think of this as a little network. Here is ones, and it's defined by taking the output and feeding it back in, but sticking a one in front of it. So ones, the whole thing, is got by putting one on the front of the whole thing. You can see that that will forever give me Whatever I take from that will be a one, and there will still be more ones where that came from. So that's given us those. Um, we could have all the numbers. We could build the numbers from n. We get by starting with n and then carrying on with n plus one. That will give us that. Um, we can do the primes. Now, this is what's called the sieve of Eratosthenes. Um, what does it say? Just briefly, it says you get the primes by sieving all the numbers from 2. What does sieve do? It takes the first number in the, in the stream and removes all the duplicates of that number in the remainder of the stream. So it says, say h here would be 2, and then what we do is stick 2 on the front and then cut off all the multiples of 2 in the remainder and sieve the result. So what cut do, does is remove all the multiples of 2, and then we do a sieve, first thing in L will be 3, so we remove all the multiples of 3, and so on. So this gives us a, an infinite stream of primes. And what else? This is more fun. Um, we can write the Fibonacci numbers like this. The first number is 0, the second number is 1, and then what we do is zip together what we've got already with the tail of what we've got already. Because um, what we're doing is we're adding the number 2 before and the number 1 before. And that gives us, um, so we're zipping together 0 here. The first thing in here will be 0, the first thing in here will be 1. So the first thing in here is 1. And then the next thing will be adding 1 and 1 to give us 2. Um, so there we've got, and this is all this looks just like list programming, except that we've got that magical question mark at the front. So we're building these suspensions rather than, um, rather than building real lists. And then when we evaluate, we get to see what's going on. Uh, and you can see this as a, as, a, as a network, if you like. Here are Fibonacci numbers. Here's the tail of the list. What we do is take the fibs and the tail of the fibs and add them pairwise and stick them back in the list. So we get 0 and 1 and then 0 and 1 gives us 1 and then 1 and 1 gives us 2 and so on. So we're able to write these sorts of stream programs and under the hood what we're using is suspensions, these functions that take a, the, empty, the empty argument to the stuff that's inside and then unsuspending when we need to. Let me try and do a demo. This is always a bad idea, I know. Um, I'm going to sit down. Uh, oh, I don't 
See here, I have um, I have the code that I explain. Oh, sorry, let me make that a bit bigger. Oh, and let's get rid of that. Uh, sorry, I want, if I can get rid of that. Excuse me, how do I? Oh, oh, I think if I can grind down, there we are. Shall I make that a bit bigger again? So you can see this is precisely the code I showed you earlier on. We've got cons defined as um, as this uh, as this macro that replaces a call of cons with this thing that wraps the stuff inside this function call. Here's my um, here it is as a function, which of course doesn't work properly, but um, we're not going to use that. And here is head. What head does, remind you, we take the, the con, the, the stream, which will be something like this, we apply it to the empty argument, that gives us the stuff inside, we pattern match that and just take the head. And similarly for the tail. And here's our ones, so here are all our definitions. Now, um, what can I do? I have a little auxiliary function That, which just prints out the first n element. So let's just go to Earl. Let's compile our stream. It should have been compiled, but anyway. Let's. Uh, can I control L? No. Uh, so let us do. What should we do? A stream. What P's does is it just it prints out the first n elements of a stream. So let's say stream primes. I don't know, let's say and ooh, let's say twenty. Let's see what that does. There we are. Then we're getting the first twenty primes. You can see that it's taking. It took a bit of time when it got down there. That's something we'll come to a bit later on. Um, we could do a similar thing with fibs. And it's taking some time here. This is um, this is interesting. This is crucial, if you like. It is. It's not doing this very quickly. What I said we've got is evaluation on demand. Um, I should. I chose the wrong consonant. But anyway, so we've got. We have a stream library which is not terribly efficient. What are we going to do? Let's go back to our presentation and take a look. Oops. Oh, help. What's happened? <laughs> uh, uh, where's my... I don't want system preferences. Sorry, this... Uh, I want to be in Keynote. Where was I? I don't let me start where I stopped. Okay, so we were looking at uh, looking at these examples, and you could see that we were producing Fibonacci numbers, but it was a bit slow. The problem is, for example, we've got a call to fibs here, and we've got a call to fibs here. We're probably duplicating computation there. I've not tried to optimize this. But there are deeper problems than that. And let's, let's try and explore those a bit. Um, we're getting what look like nice circular, circular computations. Um, and, but we are getting this repeated recomputation. How much longer have I got? Uh, yeah, let's say 10 minutes. 10 minutes, OK, fine. Okay, well, I, I can just carry on talking. No, no, no. no. <laughs> That's a form of negotiation. Um, so I talked about evaluation on demand. So what we were getting was by building these, um, by building these these closures, by um, wrapping up our stuff inside a function call, 
we were getting the effect of not, um, not evaluating something until we wanted to, so we could build these infinite lists, we could take a head of an infinite list without um, looking at the tail. So we, we've got half the way there. But what we haven't got is what's called lazy evaluation. And that's another dimension. In lazy evaluation, what we try and do is ensure that each argument is only evaluated once, or at most once. We don't care if it's never evaluated, but we don't want to re-evaluate it. So how do we do that? Well, oh, bloody autocorrect. This should say memoized. It shouldn't say memorized. Apologies. Ah, oh, damn. Anyway. I think memorizing results, yeah, okay, it's kind of useful for if you've got exams or whatever, but it's not the same. So we must ensure that we keep a record of results. So we have to do some sort of, we have to do something a bit cleverer. But oh, for goodness sake, isn't that what the compiler should be doing? Are we, do we really want to do this in Erlang? Are we pushing things too far? Well, maybe, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> the key idea is that we have to manage how results are stored once we've evaluated them. So, simple enough. So there are two options. And I'll talk about the first, and the, I'll leave the second for you to look at, the, the, um, look at in the um, repo if you want to. We can use an ETS table, good old, impure functional programming to the rescue. We can use that to keep track of results, or we can actually do this purely functionally, though it is we have to change the way that we represent our streams, and that's the, it's, it's worked through in the, in the repo. By modeling the store functionally and passing it around explicitly as a, a map, effectively, through all our calculations. But threading that through when you're doing things lazily is a bit of a nightmare. But let's, let's look at the ETS table stuff. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we effectively do what's in this picture. We have an ETS table which stores two sorts of things. It tells us where the next bit of free storage is, and the things that we store in there are either a thunk, one of these functions, which is wrapping up some stuff, or we store the result of evaluating that thunk. So we have references into this table, um, and we use this, the, the zero slot as a place to to store where our next free slot is. So it's, not, it's a simple representation. And, okay, cons becomes a tiny bit more complicated. What do we do when it's still a macro? So we've got the same code, this is nice, we've got the same code as we had in the, for the streams, but the macro is doing a bit more work under the hood. What do we do? Well, we update what the next reference is, we add one to it, we insert our, um, our thunk, our stuff wrapped up inside a function at the next reference. And then we return, what's the result of the cons? The result of the cons is now a symbolic reference to a place where the result will be stored rather than the result itself. So I'm building refs into Erlang using ETS tables, if you like. Though I could do it purely functionally, see the, um, see the subsequent stuff. So with that, we pretty much get what we want. Well, we have to change head slightly as well. What does head do? Head now has to do an uh, switch. Head, you look in the ETS table, if it's a pair, then you just return the head, that's fine, because it's already there in the table. If not, you better evaluate it, stick that value in the table where it belongs, and then return the head of that value. So if it's one of these, you take it out and return, re replace it with one of these by applying F to the, by applying this, by working out what the stuff is inside F. Um, so, you know, it's, but again, you know, just, just going back to the original um, topic of this, it's about using functions in a, in a creative way. 
And then with that, we can, um, we've got the same code, and we get efficient stuff. So let me just briefly, I have got another demo. Um, oh yeah, here we are. I mean, I, ah, yes, whoa. I don't have exactly the same code, and this is the last bit of the knot tying. When I build this cons, I know that it's going to be put in the next reference, so I make the thing it refers to an explicit, um, an explicit call to the, so that the, the call to cons here is actually the same as this. I'm tying that knot. So, okay, I'm getting, it's a bit grubby, it's a bit lower level, but we get the efficiency we want. And we could do a similar thing with, um, with Fibonacci. But we transform that a bit. We build, we have the same cons, but we have these, it's cons onto those two reps, so we know that. Um, and now we can do ginormous Fibonacci numbers, memoized in this way. So, again, it's a... Uh, We get full lazy evaluation. We used impure features, but we got a smooth transition. Perhaps because we don't have time. You can play with it. It's, it's there in the repo, um, so you, why don't I leave you to play with it? Doing this with an explicit store, what, oh, I chose the wrong color here. What we have to do is change our functions so that instead of taking an input to an output, they take two inputs, the real input and the store before you do the operation, and give us two, two results the real result and the store after. So we're threading that store all the way through the computation. Um, for example, if you're pulling out the first n values, you have to take the, the, um, the store here, pass it in, it gets side affected, and then you use the new version there. Not so nice. Um, and making it work is a bit more complicated, but if you'd like to see, it's a bit like um, circuses used to have dogs walking on their hind legs. This is about, it's a bit like Erlang walking on its, on its hind legs, getting, getting full declarative lazy evaluation inside Erlang. Right, I thought, have I got enough slides? So I got up early this morning and wrote some more slides. I clearly did have enough slides, so I don't need to tell you about a more general mechanism for memoizing. Um, but you can use ETS tables for memoizing values of functions. And I said in the abstract I was going to say a tiny bit about dependent types, and this just nudges at it. Um, this is a sort of, this is a way of doing some memoization in the data, if you like. What I'm building here are what we call vectors, which are lists which have carry their, their size with them. Um, and then, if I want the length of a vector, I simply take the first component. Um, so we've got some examples there. If I apply the join, I have a, join, a vector version of the join function. Well, remember what join does, it takes a list of things um, in a list and uh, separates them with a separator. So we get that the length of the list is, is um, twice the length of the original minus one. And then what we can do is define a macro which returns the right result. So again, it's playing with functions and macros. But I'm running out of time, so I'm going to conclude. Have I got two minutes to conclude? Uh, yeah. Okay. Functions are flexible and powerful. I hope you've seen that. We've seen a whole lot of examples, strategies, classes, simulation, simulating different sorts of evaluation. That's good. Pure modeling of effects is not that easy. So you see in the world of Haskell, things like monads and monotransformers and effects and so on, they're still pretty complicated. Um, but they are some nice design patterns, and there were hints of those in here. And I'm sure that we will see Monad libraries and so on coming into Elixir and Erlang. Ooh, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> A final point. Everything I talked about was using data, type, data as it was 30 years ago. And that would be equally true in Haskell. What has changed is the way that people deal with types. So the Erlang type system is perhaps around where things were 20 years ago. The Haskell type system has moved on. But it's, you, can do, you can still do the same things. Um, the values are exactly the same, functions, um, algebraic types, and so on. 
all the data used here is well understood a long time ago. And at that point, I'm going to stop. Thank you. How does Erlang get along with uh, very large matrices and its operations? Very large matrices. Yes, and operations between matrices, that multiplication and, and all that stuff. I think I would just use I would use a library in a different language. I think you, you, use, you should use the right tool for the job. There's no point in, you know, people have spent decades optimizing. You should probably use Fortran. <laughs> Don't use C, use Fortran. That's today's takeaway message. <laughs> <laughs>